All yours, Stacey. Thank you, Kathy Greggs. Um, welcome, everyone. You are joining the Fayetteville Pact um, first annual Week of Injustice. And this is our panel called Unbroken Silence. Um, tonight is going to be, be very powerful. It's going to have um, a lot of truth and uh, a lot of exposing of the corruption and uh, the racial injustices that we see uh, throughout Cumberland County, the Sheriff's Department, the Police Department, um, the Detention Center. We have um, people who have been um, unjustly incarcerated on the call. We have uh, people who have uh, suffered because of the police corruption. They have very personal stories to tell. And we thank you for, we thank all of the panelists for, for joining us tonight to share these stories. These are some heavy burdens to bear. I've. Um, I've been asked to moderate this panel because I've spent some time over the last few months documenting these stories of injustice for Fayetteville Pact and, and um, supporting Fayetteville Pact's efforts to get these stories out there. Um, these are some very moving, some very disturbing stories. And I feel like it's really important that we all bear witness to this and that we, we make sure that, the, that these stories are uplifted and that everyone, all communities, especially um, the white people that I represent are standing up and demanding justice, making calls um, so that things can change because the, the truth is the system as it stands now is incredibly unjust and it's, it's disgusting the way that people are treated um, like they're not people, like they don't have rights and like their health and that their freedom doesn't matter. And um, I think we've all had enough of that. So um, I think we're gonna go around now and introduce uh, the people that we have here with us tonight. Um, if we could just start off by, you know, you could tell us your name, who you are, and uh, maybe a little bit about what you want to come here to talk to talk about tonight. Um, Andrew Willis, would you like to go first? Oh, hold on, Andrew, you're muted. Is that my muted? Can you hear me? We can hear you now. All right, thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Andrew um, R. Willis, and I'm here to talk about um, injustice uh, being in incarcerated for over three years and one month for nothing, you know, where federal police officers and evidence and manipulated, manipulated the system to use where they can where you can't detect it, where they try to, you know, they use it as a form where you cannot detect it. And I, my story, I would like to tell my story, but, it, you know, I want you to bear with me as I tell it story when, it, um, when it's time for me to tell it. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I remember your story very well. It's one of the, the first ones that I did. And the fact that you were incarcerated yeah. twice for two long terms, um, for charges that were completely fabricated, um, that you ended up getting dismissed, is um, but you lost that time, and um, I look forward to for you sharing more of that a little bit later on. Uh, yeah. Marcus Marcus Harden, would you like to introduce yourself and tell a little bit about what you're here to talk about? Hey everybody, I'm Marcus Harden. Uh, I'm here for justice to prove that you know innocent man can be sent to prison. And how corrupt coming to me really is when it comes to inmates. And the things that I went through during the COVID, the repercussions that I had to take, being away from my family, uh, judges, lawyers, DAs, you know, they, they just don't believe in fighting or letting us fight to prove our innocence when we have proof. And I'm just getting tired of it because there's a lot of people that are still incarcerated or still sitting in the county right now that's being held without nothing. Can't get a speedy trial. Lawyer won't present the innocence to the DA. The judge is not listening to them. And then whenever you find that they're doing something wrong to an inmate in the county, anything, they try to silence you and 
send you all the way somewhere else to, to punish you because you're actually telling the truth. And it's time for a change and it needs to be stopped. Thank you, Marcus. And um, I mean, everyone's story ha is, is so compelling and had, you know, everyone had, um, had so much injustice happen to them. I, I know with, with your story, you were, um, you had documentation showing that, um, you know, you, you couldn't have done what you were charged with because it, you, you had an alibi basically. And, um, you know, even your public defender was not listening to that. And those are the same themes that are common. Um, I keep hearing this again and again, nobody wants, nobody wants to help, even when there's documentation, even when there's evidence, um, people are being labeled as criminals when they have proof showing that they're not, and no one wants to listen. It's, a, it's incredibly frustrating. And I know, um, in addition to that, you were incarcerated during COVID and, and faced some, some really unsafe conditions um, and actually got, were uh, contracted COVID while you were incarcerated. And I hope you'll share a little bit more about that later on. Uh, thank you, Marcus. You're welcome. Um, Gregory. Um, Gregory is here because his, uh, his brother was killed. Gregory, can you tell us a little bit about what happened to Matthew? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, January 9th of this year, uh, my brother was, had been, he was drinking, had been drinking or whatever, and him and his girlfriend got into an argument, and uh, he went to our cousin's house and while sitting at our cousin's house in the vehicle, he called 911 seeking attention. While seeking attention, uh, he hung up the phone. He told him he was bleeding out. He hung up the phone. They called him back. He wouldn't respond. So they sent police officers out. Once the police officer got out, they claim he communicated threats to the police officers. Uh, it hasn't been recorded that he communicated threats. We're going on what law officers say. But upon communicating threats, they stayed on the property, which was our family's property, for approximately 45 minutes. And after that, he communicated. They was back and forth on the phone with him. They said he communicated more threats to them, not no one else. Upon communicating threats, they took their tactical vehicle, drove down a dirt road where he was sitting. They ram, rammed him. They ran into his vehicle. They come from behind the SWAT team vehicle and shot down on him while he was sitting in the vehicle. They shot him in excess of 30 times for communicating threats, according to them. There was no body cam. There was no dash cam. And when we presented it and the DA, of course, the SBI done a report. And the DA said all the police officers story was the same. So that's what we got stuck with as far as any kind of just or unjust with the uh, law officers or the justice system. And as of right now, uh, they're saying that no charges will be filed on any police officers, that it was justified to shoot him the way they did because he communicated threats. And it's one of them situations where what do you do in that kind of situation? I mean, it's unreal. And Miss Kathy, she knows what, how they shot him. She's, she's seen pictures of it. And if they shot him worse than you would have shot a wild animal. But it was justified according to the DA. It was justified. So they went off the law officer's words and that's all. And he hadn't hurt anyone. He hadn't pulled a gun out on anyone. He communicated threats. They said that he said he had a gun and then it come out that it was a toy gun. And then when we seen what they said was a gun, it was a 
a wood stock, the wood stock of a gun. Didn't have a barrel. It was just a wood stock in the vehicle uh, stuck down between the seat and the center console. So it's one of those things to where the family don't know what to do. And I mean, you reach out, you reach out and you reach out. And then when it comes to where the DA tells part of the family that there's nothing we can do, then you have them fighting against each other. And it's like, it's just, it's a messed up situation to be in. We didn't, I didn't bash any police officers by all means, but if you go shoot someone, you ain't got to shoot them 30 times, especially when he's not shooting back at you. I, I hear you, Gregory. And again, I say I'm so. Say again. I'm so sorry for your loss. And um, I just wanted to say, we, I hear you. And so, again, so sorry for your loss. Um, it's such a violent, senseless loss. I mean, um, in, in Matthew's case, you know, he, he was someone who needed mental health, you know, he needed mental uh, crisis support. And instead they respond with the, with a SWAT team and, and shoot someone who's not holding a gun, who's not threatening them, who's inside his, his own car on private property. Um, like you said, just, just really in such a violent and awful and brutal way. And um, there's no accountability. I mean, there's a point to where it's like, um, you know, when there's, especially when you put these stories together, like there's cover-ups. I mean, they they tried to make it look like Matthew had a gun and that wasn't the truth. Um, like, like, you, like you explained, um, you know, they try to do anything they can to, to justify it. And if you just take one case, it's, you know, it seems like something um, that people try to forget or something or excuse, but really when you see all of them together, there's this systemic patterns that keep, that keep repeating. And um, I just wanted to point out that, um, that Matthew is um, Native American and that Fayette Bell Pact um, fights, you know, for, for all communities, like Kathy said at the beginning, for justice for all communities, um, whoever is suffering from this unjust system. Um, we'll get, hopefully we can talk more about, about Matthew's case later. Um, Bible Stokes, would you like to introduce yourself and say a little bit about why you You're still muted Bible if you tried to unmute, but if I can also try coming back later. Hello? Yes. <clears throat> Go ahead. My name is Bible Stokes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, my sister was recently incarcerated for second degree murder. So the police says, um, I don't know too much about that story in the beginning, like the beginning part of the story. Um, my sister, Crystal Stokes does, she's up here somewhere. Um, so I think it's injustice for my sister for the simple fact that uh, it was more like domestic violence of a relationship than just her deciding to want to kill somebody one day or one night. Um, both parties was intoxicated. Um, they was arguing and I guess one thing led to another, which was the abuse. Um, and her daughter was there at the time. So being threatened with the gun, not knowing what somebody's intentions really are, out of their state of mind, you know, without alcohol being involved. You can't put nothing, you just don't know. Um, so that's what we stand right now. And the Hope County Depart of Police Department, not police department, but the the courts, the justice system, um, they have their own thing going on. So that's why we were connected to Miss Kathy. And she knows a lot about the story also. I apologize, I'm not good with this kind of stuff. So, you know. 
You're doing fine. Um, thank you for being here. And Crystal, did you wanna did you wanna say anything um, as uh, Mona Lisa Stokes's cousin who knows a lot about this case? You're still on mute, Crystal. Or I can I can go uh, to some. Hello. Yep. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought you was un unmuting me. Um, like she said, my name is Crystal Stokes. Um, I know Bible said I was I'm their sister. We were raised as sisters, but we are first cousins. Our mothers were sisters. Um, but yeah, Mona Lisa, she was um she was charged with second degree murder. <clears throat> and all throughout the case, all throughout her paperwork, they they automatically from day one said there was malice involved. And they hadn't, you know, heard her side, hadn't done anything, you know, hadn't they just came, saw a body, and just automatically assumed, not to mention that what Bible didn't mention was that their their birth mother, which is my mom's sister, my aunt, was killed in a similar situation by her boyfriend. I mean, almost identical. When we try to talk to the to her, to Mona Lisa's uh attorney, her court appointed attorney, of course, he said that has no, that has nothing to do with anything. Her mental state really, we, that doesn't really, you know, we don't have to worry about that. They, she's been sitting in jail since 2019. Um, and she was threatened at the time. Um, according to her, none of us were there, but according to her, which they had been fighting, they, she had came back to my grandmother's house to take a break and he asked her to come back and they got into another fight that night with, the, not with her nine year old daughter there. And he threatened, okay, I'll shoot you. He had been threatening her with a gun before. She told the police all this but she knew that they didn't have bullets. This time she didn't know if he had gotten bullets um, over the weekend that she was gone. So they just said none of that mattered. It, it, you know, it was malice. It was a crime of passion. Like just so many lies that they're saying she, she meant to do it. She took the kids away and it's like, all of these things can easily be proven because her older kids, they were like, I think 18 and 20 at the time or something like that. So, they never even lived at the house had they dropped her off but the point is is that all of this was in there her attorney won't even when she's saying no these are lies and these can easily be proven he said don't you you don't have to worry about that that's for me to worry about but she doesn't you know this is her freedom so it's just a lot like 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 everybody and I'm sorry to hear about everybody else's story but there's a lot of injustice you know that's going on and that won't get her the mental help that she needs anything Thank you, Crystal. Yeah, that's that's very much another um, common thread that that keeps coming up again and again. That people's health, um, whatever their needs might be, anyone from who's needed blood pressure medication, people who are being exposed or even contracting COVID, people with mental health or um, addiction who need treatment. Um, you know, it's they say that prison, you know, is supposed to be about rehabilitation. We know that that's not true. Really, people go in there and they get they get sicker uh, because of the the horrible conditions in there. Um, I'm sorry that that Mona Lisa is there. I think that everything you said, you know, her her story is she was defending herself in domestic violence, but the people in control of the narrative, the police and the DA, you know, they decided that without looking at any of the extenuating circumstances that she was gonna be charged with second degree murder and that separated her from her children. And now it's been um, um, just you know a while. She's been in there almost two years now, I think. Um, and getting no help from her defense attorney and another common thread. Um, I think before we we move on to maybe another question or another story or someone sharing, um, you know, more in depth. I was wondering if we missed anybody on the call as far as um, is anyone here for a story that that we didn't touch on yet with at least one person talking about it. Okay, I was wondering if we could go back to Marcus and um, Marcus, could you could you talk a little bit about uh, what you did to try to um, make sure that the Cumberland County Deten Detention Center was, uh, you know, protecting the incarcerees from the COVID spread. You, you were incarcerated shortly before COVID uh, 
you know, became a big thing here in the United States. You did some um, advocacy to try to get yourself and the other people there protected. And then, um, and they didn't really like that. They kind of uh, retaliated against you. Could you tell a little bit about that part of the story? Yes, I sure can. Um, I have got in Covenant County on February 9th, 2020. And this was the COVID started coming in at that time. But by March 17, um, Cumberland County has shut the jail down for no visits. No one can come in, uh, shut us down to where we was on lockdown. So we sitting in a cell 24 hours a day and only got 20 minutes to come out to use the telephone, recreation, take a shower and order canteen. So when the COVID, first started hitting February real hard. Company County was painting a picture to everybody that was outside that we was taken care of. Uh, we had got uh, the right PPE. Uh, no one in the county had a COVID at the time and all this. But at the same time, when all it, when they were saying all this, that's when the COVID really started coming into the county. And I'm in a pod locked up with 48 inmates and They've been there two, three years, four or five years, never been sick in their life. So when we found out about the COVID, we had three dudes, three inmates in our cell that, that was not feeling too well. And they kept telling the pod officer, well, you know, I'm not feeling good, this and that. They, they wouldn't do anything until they actually felt like they was almost dying or about to die to get attention. And so they got sent out first. And then we had another man, uh, another inmate who was suffering real bad. And um, he ended up going to the hospital. They, they came and got him on a stretcher and they sent him to the hospital. So we was already on lockdown. Uh, we, they put us on lockdown May 17th. Yeah, May 17th, and we was wondering what was going on. So all the fellows that was in the pod, we was in um, pod BA, uh, was trying to figure out why we on lockdown. So they wouldn't bring the major in there to come talk to us, or no one could explain to us what's really going on. So the fellas in the pod started kicking those, and we went on a food strike to get the major to come in. So the major came in, she was telling us, well, you know, everybody got uh, the COVID. Uh, we don't know when we go test y'all. We don't know. Uh, it's up to the CDC to, to get y'all tested. And this is how everything's going to go for right now. So we, we went on with that story until that dude passed out. And until that dude went to the hospital, they came in and tested everybody. Test everybody, still on lockdown. I'm, I'm writing everything down that's supposed to be right down how the CO's not, paying us no mind. They, it's like they're like, they're not listening. Like if someone say they sick, oh, don't worry about it, put in a sick call. Then you gotta put in a sick call, you gotta pay $5 for that, no matter what. Then they'll come see you, take it, take your blood, take your blood pressure and give you some time to take. That's it. So I kept putting in for mental health because. I was having problems sleeping, couldn't breathe at night, uh, body sweat and everything. And this was before I even knew I had the COVID. So I tested positive for the COVID. Me and 15 other inmates at this time tested positive. They came in, they took us out the pod. They moved us to another pod, which was CB, and they just put us in there. Wasn't clean, nothing. It was just here. Take your bed, this is where y'all sleeping at. Brought a, brought a police officer in there, and half of them that worked at that pod didn't know that we all tested positive for the COVID. So we just sitting in there, nurse came in there, told us everybody tested positive for the COVID, brought us a piece of paper saying that we tested positive for the COVID. And at that time, I just kept putting in for mental health. Yo, I still got headaches, uh, I still can't sleep at night. Uh, what else is y'all gonna do? I mean, it, it was just so much. And we were still coming out 20 minutes a day. 
locked down 24 hours the whole entire time, the whole 14 days that we was on quarantine. So we ended up getting four more inmates in there. And it was already one in there from the trustee. And come find out, they had to cope before anybody. And those are guys that worked in the kitchen. So they was keeping that on a, on a hush about that bench. Uh, well, that man spread around the jail. So when we found that out, I'm still documenting everything that they're doing to it. I'm documenting the nurses coming in. I'm documenting uh, how many times I'm putting in for a sick call. I'm documenting who's changing gloves, who ain't changing gloves. Only ones that have face masks on this time is the COs. They don't even have, they didn't even have the right PPE on, period at all. All they were just coming in there, sitting down, and then passing trays out, and that's it. So we come off quarantine for 14 days and uh, we go right back to the pod. So as we going back to the pod, remind you that the people that was already in the pod was negative. So when we left out of the pod to go back to that pod, we test, they, didn't have, they did not test us one time at all to, go, to take us back to the pod that everybody tested negative in. So they just put us all right back together, put us all right back in the same room we stayed in. It wasn't scrub, it wasn't clean right, nothing was it left, just the way you left. If you left anything in there, it was still there. Mattress, anything. So come to find out a week later, uh, five inmates that tested positive the first time for COVID end up testing positive again. So now we have to go on quarantine again for the second time because of the mistake that they made. So out of no five, you had one that went to the hospital as well. And I hope he's doing fine. I never heard anything else about it. So at this time that I'm quarantining and I'm writing documents down, I'm talking to my uh, my best friend, which is G Money from Foxy 99. He's a, he's a DJ from three to seven. And he's, he's taking my notes and stuff. And then I'm also talking to my sister, Alexander, in New Jersey, who's recording my calls and everything, and my brother um, Miguel, letting them know everything that's going on, recording my phone calls, telling them how they're treating us in here, and all this. So I get on the phone with um, G Money, and he told me Sean had called him. And when Sean called him, Sean was telling that they was getting ready to do a protest in front of the jail about the COVID that was going on. So I was like, oh, okay, then so get his number, and I can let him know what's really going on in here, because they're sitting here telling them a whole different story for what's really going on inside this jail. So me and Sean end up connecting. We end up talking on the phone every day. He ended up talking to a couple of guys that was in the same pod with me as well. And everybody was saying the same thing that was going on in there. So one day the major come to my, uh, the, the sergeant come to my cell, uh, said, hey, we heard that you uh, have legal mail to send out. And I was like, nah, I don't already sent everything out I want to send out. And then they was like, well, we want to make sure that, you know, it get out. So I was like, so what's going on? They were like, the major want to talk to you. So I was like, well, anything the major want to say to me, she can come in this pod and say in front of everybody because it has something to do with all of us with this COVID going on. So they take me out the pod. I go to a different room, talk to the major. The majors, the captains, two captains, and the senior sergeant. Uh, for the uh, per team. So I get in there, uh, she first thing said, oh, I heard uh, you talking to uh, Fayetteville Pack, uh, telling them everything that we got going on in. I just want to make sure you're telling the truth. And, and you got them out there in front of the jail protesting with three people around them and this and that. So I was like, I said it five times to this lady. I said, listen, I do not want to talk in this room unless my lawyer is present. They ignored it. So I'm not saying anything at this point in time. So the whole time I'm sitting in this room and they keep trying to get me to talk and she keeps saying, why you want to do this to a black woman? You know, the white man would do worse. Uh, you know, I know the judge and you know, I'm real close to the DA and I'm looking at her and I'm saying, well, what that supposed to mean? And then I was like, it's crazy how, this only thing I really said and I said, it's crazy how y'all is making all these monies off the inmates being in here but y'all don't want to get nobody no help. 
So she get on the phone with her lawyer. Oh, oh, he getting paid for inmates in here, uh, this and that. And he get on the phone to my phone. He must be ludicrous thinking of that. And I said, nah, you must be ludicrous because you ain't getting what I'm saying neither. So I go back to my room. I had a, a, a bunk mate, I mean, a, a cellmate that slept at the front of the door. He told me that, hey, they was in your room search. Everybody that was in there was watching. They wrote it down and everything, wrote the time down and everything. So I go to my room. And then I come find out that the documents that I was using to take notes on, which was a canteen paper that they um, was giving us when we ordered canteen in there, it was gone. So I go to my door, I hit the button, talk to the CO. I said, hey, when they left out my room, did you see them come out my room with anything in their hands? And she said, no. So I said, well, I need agreements. She said, you got to put it on the kiosk. I said, no, I want paper agreements with the numbers on it. So she gave me the paper agreements. I write the agreements. I got on the phone that day and I talked to Sean. And I told him what was going on. Because by that time, now I got the police. Every time I come out for wreck, because we're off lockdown at this point in time, the police keep following me. Every, every time I use the phone, the police is standing right there beside me on the phone. I moved to another phone. They're standing right there beside me on the phone again. So they just kept following me around. It didn't bother me at all. I, I thought it was, it was quite funny. So long story short, I put in agreements that night, explaining to them how officers came in my room, took legal documents from me, which I had legal mail written on it as well. And I had a case file number on that to, to prove my innocence in the charges that I was facing at that time. So when I had told the senior sergeant this, they brought my mail back to the pod, gave him my mail back, I turned a grievance in that night, June 25th, turned a grievance in that night to a, a sergeant, senior sergeant. And the next day, they sent me away. They packed, they, they told me to pack my stuff. And that was it. So I go to the front, they take my stuff from me, they put me in a van, and they sent me all the way to Northampton County in uh, Jackson, Jackson, North Carolina. They sent me to a whole nother county. And when they sent me up there, they sent me as a safekeeper. And the safekeeper order was signed by the same judge who I ended up going to see for a bond reduction. So long story short, the safekeeper order was uh, avoid a breach of peace of any state or county. I never heard of it. Never knew where it stood for anything because the first thing that came to my mind was where they're thinking of starting riots or anything like that. Now, mind you, I never had a write-up. I never caused a fight. I never had no problem with no officers in this county at all. I didn't bother nobody. I was just studying and just talking to my peoples on the phone and letting them know everything that's going on. So they sent me all the way to Northampton without nothing. My, my legal mail, hygiene, money in my canteen, everything. They, they, they didn't send me, they sent me all the way, all the way up there for nothing. That's two and a half hours from Fairville, but my family is from Davidson. So they make it like three and a half. So I never got a visit. And I stayed up there from June all the way to April, the end of April. And um, the whole time I was up there as well, it was like they had COs that, that died from the COVID up there. And no one ever got tested or anything when we requested. Or uh, when one thing did happen, I did end up getting the shot, the Moderna shot up there, which that was a good thing. That was the only thing that came good out of it. But it was just, when I found out the reason why they sent me up there and the reason why I couldn't get a bomb reduction and everything else, it was just crazy. So I ended up, they, um, Kathy and Sean, I mean, they finding me a private investigator named Mike. And um, this man drove, from Charlotte all the way to Northampton, which is about maybe like six or seven hours just to come see me. They helped me with my case. And if it really wasn't for him and the Fayetteville pack to take my story and listen and and know that I'm speaking the truth about everything, I think the situation would have been even worse for what, uh, what was going on because the lawyers, my lawyer, the first time he came, he said, he drove two and a half hours to come see me. 
And he, the first time he came to see me, he never broke my motion of discovery with him. The first thing he talked about was taking a plea. He didn't care about nothing else. And I find that quite odd for him to really come two and a half hours to talk about a plea. So every time we end up talking, he always talking about a plea. So when I got the private investigator, I didn't have to deal with my lawyer no more. My private investigator did everything. He, we found statements, story changes, evidence, proof that I was somewhere else. I wrote the state bar. I, I did everything I was supposed to do to prove my innocence. And then come find out that that didn't matter. It didn't matter at all because they didn't care. All they wanted was, here, make him take this plea. That's it. And I wasn't going to take the plea. The only reason I took the plea because I talked to my private investigator. And we talked. And my lawyer, me going to trial, fighting for my life, end up being in prison for life, it wasn't worth it. So that's when I, that's when I took the plea and came home and I, and I got back in contact with the pack and I, I want to put the story out there because it's wrong because I asked for a speedy trial. I asked for, uh, I asked to, for like, I had two different lawyers. I kept asking those conflict of interest in both lawyers. No one could explain to me. They were just doing so much stuff behind my back that it didn't make no sense. Then I ended up taking the plea, go to prison and come find out that, that the plea that I was originally was supposed to take, they ended up dropping two charges or the same charge that I was supposed to take and move the date of one of the one of the charges to a date that when I came out the first time for prison that I never knew nothing about. And this was a case uh, worker that was in prison telling me all this. And she was and she wrote everything down for me. And she said, there's no way that they can drop these charges right here and end up charging me for this and all on the same charges. So it's wrong, but I'm not going to stop fighting because I'm not going to stop fighting because uh, something needs to be changed. You're right, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing your story and, you know, and how you, even though you know, you put yourself at risk that you, you stood up for what was right and, um, you know, didn't let them get away with hiding that they were really taking no measures to protect any of the inmates from, from COVID. And, um, you know, as you explained, that's really shocking that because you, you filed a grievance and were making noise about this, that they sent you, you know, two hours away um, because of that. And it's, to me, you know, it seems like with no explanation of why that was happening. I mean, it seems like very clearly that it was retaliation. Um, thank you for, for sharing that. I wanna go back to um, Andrew Willis and then we're gonna have Rashad join us after that. But Andrew, I wanted, I wanted to delve a little bit into um, the theme of police corruption. And can you tell me um, in your case, uh, sp especially the the second time that you were incarcerated, kind of what what happened? Um, what happened? How, how did they get? How did they charge you with with something? And, and how did you know that? Uh, or what proof was there that they were lying about it? Oh wait, could you? Let's see. Can you unmute yourself? All right. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. All right. Um, I got. I came down here in North Carolina to visit. You know, and um, I was um, falsely locked up September the fourteenth, two thousand seventeen, where they took a charge me with a whole lot of charges, and I didn't know what it was for. You know what I'm saying? Because it came September, and I got here March. So. They wouldn't 
they didn't have no legal papers or no no kind of law library or nothing was in Cumberland County Jail. So I sat in Cumberland County Jail for a total of about eight, nine months. No lawyer come to see me. I had to file paperwork. So I, I wrote the lawyer and told the lawyer that I wasn't here on these warrants that they gave, they gave me because I'd never been in North Carolina before. So I couldn't get my work record. But I drive forklift at a company in Richmond, Virginia. So I couldn't get my um, um, paperwork showing that I'd never been here at that time, you know? So how can you give me human trafficking and all these charges? Uh, it gave me horrendous charges which would put me in prison for life. But when I showed them that they, they lowered my bond to 25000 because that my bond was 400000 and they put they had me on the news saying that I, I, I human trafficked females, I raped females and did all types of stuff, and I never did this, and I never even been in North Carolina at that time, you know? So when I took him, I kept saying on the phone as I've been locked up, while I was locked up, that they, they took him, made me take a plea, but they would not dismiss the charges. They had the charges on me and, and would not dismiss it. Even after I took them, uh, motions and got the discovery and showed that they, they switched evidence was inside the police station. They, they tried to do this. And they took and went and told these females to say this because they had charges. And they was running, they were using like a, like an organized crime. Like they were using females that had charges and they had people go and talk to them. And they put them under this certain status, under a human traffic victim status. So you can't get paperwork or nothing. You can't get nothing on them because that makes you like a confidential witness. You know? So, I kept saying this within the term and writing in courts and stuff, and the judge even threatened me. The senior judge, Judge Amos, at the, at the Superior Court, he threatened me with life and all this because I wouldn't take a plea. So I finally got down to the charge. They said they're going to dismiss all the charges, you know, and they say that they're going to um, drop it down to just give me a charge to, to listen to a prosecutor. And they had dropped all them charges that they didn't put me on the news for what they had locked me up for. So I told them, I'm a sue. So I get out from there, from the charges. I get out on, on March the 19th. I mean, I get out February the 19th, 2019. So when I get out February the 19th, nine days after I released, these officers, they, they've been watching me. They done put me down as living at an address that they serving a search warrant to. And I, and I ain't never lived there before in my life. And I ain't never been in North Carolina. I ain't even know no address. So what they did, they put it me on there. and came when I was standing out in the front smoking a cigarette. I just pulled up and got out and to smoke a cigarette. They pull up and they also jump out and they take and jump out with a emergency response team they throw a grenade inside the pot and, and, and blow it up and everything. So I'm asking them, why is y'all locking me up? They never tell me why they locked me up. One no search warrant and nothing saying that I did commit any crime. So they take me down and charge me with trafficking cocaine, possessing a cocaine, owning a dwelling, and all kinds of charges. And I trying to figure out how y'all gonna charge me with this, and I just pull up, and uh, and I got the body cam footage showing that this is what they did, you know, that they took and just charged me with this. It was in retaliation that they heard me on the phone because they had my phone bugged while I was in Cumberland County Jail for a whole year. They bugged it for the whole time I was there, and they kept hearing me saying I'm gonna sue them, and I'm gonna sue them. So they put. Nine days after I got out, they put me on that. Then they put on there that I, I'm known to carry a weapon. I never carried a weapon in my life. Never been convicted of no weapon. Nobody never said I carried a weapon in my life. They put that down so they sent that emergency response team in there with no body cam footage on so they could shoot me up in this, this resident and say that I had a gun on me and think I don't know. You know, They put me in the car, so I'm telling them, I said, y'all trying to lock me up for retaliation. I'm sitting in the car telling them this, 
and tell them that this is I know what they did because because they had charges I beat and I write the and I write the course and set and file in my own motion. So what they did was they took me down to the police station, took me in the interview room. I'm sitting in the interview room with the officer. The officer trying to tell me he's gonna take the money in the house that's inside the house and add it to the money that's in my pocket. I said, you can't do that. Y'all trying to set me up. I need to talk to your supervisor. He never brought no supervisor to talk to me. They took me in there and put me in the jail and charged me with all these charges saying I was busy. I, I was in possession of all these drugs. So I sit in the in the jail almost 15 to 16 months before I even got a discovery. I, I filed motions after motion after motion. I doing all my paperwork, I'm filing motions. I filed two lawsuits against the state, you know, and against the police officers for, you know, plan evidence. So when I get the discovery, I couldn't find out that they took money out the um guy pocket that owned a house that they had the search one on and they took the, the money out of his pocket. They did not put the money in the police station or write no supplement reports or none state that they took this money from this man. They took this money from this man and added it to mine to try to bring up proper cause to lock me up. Then one of the officers in the house calling my nickname. I'm not on no search one. Why is you sitting in here calling juice? You saying juice stays in this room. The chaplain said the juice stays in this room. How is I say this? Have you ever been in this house that you had to search one? They didn't put me in this house and put it in, and put it in so they could have probable cause to arrest me. You know, because when they went in the house, they said they found drugs, but I have all the evidence and everything and the discovery, and they don't show no drugs found in the house. Number the marijuana found within that man's house. Which, it was just the search one was on him and his girl next door. I don't live there. I'm not on the, the power bill or nothing. All that in the discovery that was searched that I'm not on the power bill. It shows that another officer took the money and she signed, she gave it to another female officer and she signed stating that that came out of my pocket. And uh, Sergeant James Yao, uh, Ke Officer Kelly Tudor, and, uh, and uh, Officer Mark Ruff. They signed this paper saying that this money came on my pocket, $913.80, which I ain't had nothing but $268 in my pocket, which on the video, when the officer shook me down and set me down, I stated that I don't have nothing but $268 in my pocket. They, they refused to give me a receipt. It took me almost 16 months to get a receipt to see how much money that they said that I had in my pocket. Then when I look at it, it said 913 out. This is what he said to the magistrate. He could have falsified documents and fabricated statements. To do this, it's like an organized, it was like organized, you know, where they do this to trick because this is what they do. They, they, they read cases. They go on into, and, and looking up cases, the officer so they can manipulate the system, you know, because it goes to the Supreme Court or, uh, you know, cases like that, and they'd be reviewed, and then it'd be hard to fight them if they manipulated and they use so many different people in the side of, um, you know, inside the precinct, because you can't detect every person, because you have to know every person's name and every person, you know, who things is given to. You know, if you take money out of your pocket, you got to know her name, you got to know the officer's names and that. And see, my lawsuit has been in now for, um, for almost, uh, 15 months, and and now on my lawsuit, they say they denied me the answer in the interrogatories, and they're trying to put a protected order on the um, video from the interview room. They're saying that they're trying to put a protected order on it so it can't be shown to the public. But and it, the whole thing is, with what the officers say, you must show transparency, right? You cannot they can lock nobody up and not show transparency. The words that I'm saying is facts from videos showing facts. Why can't it be shown? Why do you have to put a protective order on it? You know, they put a protective order on it to keep the public from knowing that what their police is. This is organized crime. I got one, two, three, four, five, 
six, seven, it's, it's almost eight officers within there in different ranks that was doing it. Even it, when, they, when they put that human trafficking in and all that rape stuff in there, I had to go down to jail and sit in the jail. It was on the news that I had raped and burnt a female, that a female was on the run that they took and used. And he's telling them the dates and everything. I have all the video, all the statements and everything, how they were doing it. He was leading the whole investigation, showing pictures of me. Why would you go show a girl sitting in a, in a women's prison pictures of me? You know, if you go going for an investigation, why would you go and first show the pictures of me? You know, not asking questions. You know, that right. you're supposed to be illiterate to what you're doing to her. You know? And this is this is clearly racism. There's nothing in the report when they locked me up for the um um for trafficking cocaine. There's nothing in the report or nothing saying that I committed any crime or anything. Right. I got out of van and it's shown on the video that I got out of van mm-hmm. and the people and the police said, let the van go. Mm-hmm. They said, let the van go. There's a black man standing on the front. Mm-hmm. And why would you take and throw a explosive device mm-hmm. that you just serving a sex one on? Right. And Andrew, like th- there are so many things about um, about your case, so many details that are so mm-hmm. unjust. I want to go back and recap some of what you were talking yeah. about, but I know we have someone calling in um, who okay. can only be here for a short time. So okay. let's let's switch to Rashad and then I want to come back and, and wrap up some of what you were saying right after that before we move on. Okay. So, uh, Kathy, thank you, thank you, Andrew. Kathy, are you ready to bring Rashad on? Yes, he's on. Thank you, thank you for joining us, Rashad Everett. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about your story? Can you tell us? um, I know that there was some um, some corruption in your case as well, and some some planted evidence. Can you tell us about what happened to you? Yes. in my corruption, this, this, this case has been going on since 2018. Uh, as, as known, I revealed my doorbell camera, which showed uh, officers bringing items into the house, multiple items into the house. Um, I'm currently awaiting trial. My trial is Monday. Um, I've been currently waiting for uh, 13 months. And uh, 13 months, I've been waiting for a But uh, basically, um, I was picked up at a, at my state suppression where I was trying to fight my case back in August 3rd, 2020. And um, two people, two people's, um, two of the two of the defendants um, have uh, charges have been dropped. Um, my charges have been uh, decreased to an aiding and abetting uh, with the possess. Um, I am my truth is my truth, and I'm going to stand on my truth. Um, situation. I reached out to, uh, you know, of course, the mayor. I reached out to, you know, Mayor uh, Colvin and, uh, and a couple of others. As a matter of fact, the whole county commission, all the uh, whole county. But, uh, uh, <laughs> trying to get help in this situation turn their back on it to the courts to decide what really happened. Um, so far, so good. Things are going good. It's going great. I'm, I'm holding my hands. It's great. I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready to put the situation behind me. Hopefully, uh, that, that, that I deserve. Officers that have resigned, well, basically, um, all of the officers have resigned on the case. Um, have resigned on the case. Some of them have, uh, there haven't been specific reasons, but the internal affairs findings were just released after two years. Um, so after two years, I finally got my internal affairs findings, and that's one of the officers except one on the case. Been recommended. That 
was not talked about publicly, but it is it, it, it did happen. So that's another thing that has happened. Um, but besides that, um, again, we're still pushing forward. It's, you know, it's, it's a bad situation. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Rashad. Um, is there is there anything you wanted to share about your case with the, the other people here have experienced some of them have experienced um, similar similar corruption and um, targeting by police, um, unfair trials and, and things like that or unfair um, charges or treatment. Okay, Kathy, Kathy said that the Rashad has um, um, has had to leave the call, but we definitely uh, wish him the best with his trial next week, hoping to see some sort of, um, Kathy says his date is on the 20th, hoping to see some positive outcome for him. Um, Kathy, I don't know if you had a moment to to just briefly recap a little what he was saying. I think some people might've found it hard to hear all of what he was saying uh, because of you know how he was joining. Okay, the- I'll just do a recap. Um- we met Rashard Everett based on his case. He had a doorbell camera, um, which actually saved his life for his actual case because when the police officers came, it was the drugs and narcotics gang unit. Um, when they came to his house, and first of all, it was the daycare, um, but the drugs were found at an apartment that he was subleasing um, to someone else. Um, at the time, but they came to the daycare. There was no drugs found at the daycare. So when you go back and look at the actual police um, standing there with all these items, the items that they were standing there were the items they brought into the home. There was never no drugs taken out of the home. Um, Right now he has about $20,000 missing because he was running a business where he was flipping homes. He owned seven properties. Um, So he was a postal worker. He was not related to any gang affiliation. He never been arrested in his life. He never did drugs in his life. So um, they went to his house and cut off all the cameras, but they forgot the doorbell camera. And the doorbell camera showed them bringing in all these drugs in his house. Um, They sat in his house for seven hours with no search warrant. So they were in his house waiting on a warrant. Um, And based on that, the judge that wrote that warrant or signed it off, can no longer do cases right now. She's on administrative um, desk. So let's make sure we understand that all 30 officers have been relieved from Fayetteville PD. Um, and also to, to the defendants, which was his wife and someone else that worked at the daycare, all charges have been dropped. There was no drugs ever found at the daycare. And um, he his all his charges have been dropped for trafficking, gang affiliation, and drugs to aiding and abetting. And this is three years later. He was arrested in June, 2018. Wow, three, three years um, when the, the footage shows that the, the evidence was planted. It's just, it's just mind blowing um, what, uh, what the police are able to get away with. But um, speaking up like this and spreading information is so important. Um, I wanted to go in and ask Crystal to talk a little bit, but before we do that, I wanted just um, to go back to, to Andrew to recap some of his story, because uh, we had to kind of jump in there at the end. So um, so Andrew had two different incarcerations, two different cases, both of them involved, you know, he talked about um, how the police were telling witnesses what to say. They didn't, they didn't have a case or evidence. This is another common theme that we hear, that I hear come up a lot in these stories. They didn't have really any evidence or a case, so they they tell the witnesses what to say. Um, a lot of time, these most of the times, these witnesses have other charges, so you know the the police are trying to use that as leverage against them to say incriminating things about somebody. Um, you know, it's it's all falsified. There's there was um, several instances in Andrew's case too where they they changed the evidence in the first case with the where they tried to accuse him of of being a sex trafficking ringleader for um, having shared a home with some people for a few weeks um, that he had no involvement in. 
you know, they changed one of the cell phones in, in the custody uh, was a huge red flag. They also were, were trying to tell a witness what to say. Um, in the second case, as he explained, he was uh, standing outside of a home that police had a search warrant for. He was not named on the search warrant. He had just arrived um, near the home. He wasn't involved. He wasn't named. His life was put in danger by these flash grenades that were, that were set off. Um, and then there is body cam footage that that Andrew is eventually able to uh, get to through discovery motions that show that police took money from someone else and put it in his evidence bag and used the the larger amount of money um, to to charge him with a crime. Um, so it's really like a lot of a lot of cover ups and no no consideration what, whatever for for people's rights for. For, uh, or for justice, for, for doing the right thing, or, or um, it's, it's really unsettling and it's, um, it needs, there, there needs yeah. to be change. And that's, that's a big part of Fayetteville PAC's mission. Did you wanna say anything in closing, Andrew, before we go on to? Um... Yeah, it, it, the way they put the money, um, is they had separate officers take the money from us. Like it was an officer named Steve that took the money from, um, Lemuel Hessler, the person on the search warrant, and they took his money and placed it in a Ziploc bag, money and that, but they did not write in the supplement saying that money was taken out of his pocket. They, they didn't put nowhere that he had any kind of currency in his pocket. So that when they came and took, they walked over to me, the, the same lady to get my currency, where well, another officer took it and, and, and handed it to her inside a Ziploc bag with my my wallet and my phone and everything. And also, an officer that was taking the money out of my pocket, he asked me to say $268. So he said, so as he taking me to the car, I asked him, I'm calling to the lieutenant, the lieutenant Henley, and I'm asking him why I'm being taken. Ain't no, I'm not on search one. Ain't nobody giving me no search one in there. Why is y'all taking me? And the officer told me to just keep moving and going on to the cop. And I got COPD, so I don't have no medicine with me because I don't live there and I have to get to my sister's house where I live at. And that's where the guy was giving me a ride to my sister's house. So I tell the officer, so they open the door to the car and leave me in there, you know, with no medicine. So when I get down to the um, jail, I, they have to put me on um, two breath, you know, two inhalers. Um, I had to go on the um, machine twice because I couldn't breathe and everything. You know. Then when I get down there, I can't get no medicine, you know, because I have to wait and all this. So it took me a month to get medicine and everything. So I sit there and I still don't know why did they lock me up. So I'm writing motions, motions after motions, action. Why they, you know, why they got me locked up? and asking for a discovery. So I finally get discovered. They, they, they tried not to give me discovery. It took them 16 months to give me discovery. They tried not to give me a discovery. When they give me discovery, they never had no discovery from me. The discovery was in the guy named that lived at the apartment, Lemon Hesse. They, they didn't have no discovery with me. They were trying to try me in a Jordan case to get me with the evidence and what they say, drugs in this house, but they don't have no photos. I have all the discovery and videos and evidence that, and they don't have no photos of no drugs taken out of this house, but marijuana and a little stuff. These people went in there and this officer, when he got in there and they, got, and they had the dog shit in the house, and it's on the video, the officer, they can sneak and tell the sergeant, which is, was in the back, but you can hear his voice telling the sergeant, the juice stay, the captain say the juice stays in this room. Why would the captain say I stay in that room? What is the captain? It's gotta be an organized thing for the captain to tell them when I'm not on the search warrant. Why is there so much dwelling on me and I'm not on the search warrant? Uh, I'm not in the in the affidavit saying that I committed any crimes or nothing, and and, and won't no crime done enough. Nobody 
want no criminal activity done what on that day, March the twenty eighth, while we I was standing out there, there was no criminal activity. So I was just like a bystander. I'm standing there smoking a cigarette. You search me. I could understand you search me if you had a search warrant. I wouldn't have no problem you searching me and releasing me. You know, you know, I you search me. I have nothing on me, no contraband or nothing. Why was I not released? Why was I'm taken to a police car, taken to the police station, set in an interview room, and an officer come to me and tell me, Mr. Willis, I need to um need you your rights to count your money. I said, Why are you count my money? What is you charging me with? He said, I'm not charging you with nothing. I just we just can't count your money without you know, without reading your rights. So I took him and said, well, you want to bring my money for me to count? He said, well, this, he said, Mr. Willis, um, you know something about that money in the house. I said, I don't know nothing about that money in the house. I don't live at that house. I don't have nothing to do with anything in that house. So he, right. he, said, he said, Mr. Willis, um, we put the money together in the house. I said, you can't do that. Mm-hmm. I said, you trying to set me up. I said, can I speak to a supervisor? Mm-hmm. And this is right. all on the interview room tape, and they don't want to bring it. They put a protective order on an interview room tape, but they don't want to show transparency. They don't want nobody to see. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, well, I'm I'm so glad that, in, you know, you lost, you got so many years of your life stolen from you. Um, yeah. I'm glad yeah. that you, pers- you persisted. I mean, you were very, very persistent in doing the, the, the motions for discovery. And you eventually got, in the second cases, all the charges dismissed, you know, but you didn't get... Yeah any compensation or um for your you know for the time that they they stole from you and i know you're you're still seeking justice for that um yeah. thank you thank you andrew i wanted to go to to back to crystal and to mona, mona lisa stokes's story and um crystal i'm wondering if you talk a little bit about um i know when we spoke spoke about the story we talked about like the how unfair the charges were and you compared the charges to um to the tar- to the charges in the um, in another case, and just just to show a comparison of how f- how unfair the the charges that Mona Lisa got were, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about those unfair charges and also about the real obstacles you faced in in trying to get any help from her defense attorney to uh, to build a case a defense case for her. Okay. Yes. Um, so one thing that I noticed off immediately was. Um, during the George Floyd um, case, the officer was charged with second degree murder under a million dollar bond. That's the exact same charge that Mona Lisa had under a million dollar bond. The case, none of them are, you know, none of the actions were the same. She didn't purposely try to kill this man. You know, she, it was a domestic violence situation that's documented proof of him in other previous domestic violence situations. He had a, a current restraining order against his ex. Um, which was one of his children's mother. Um, well, she had one against him for domestic violence. Yeah. And so when she was explaining all this, I didn't, I could never understand. And I asked like, how are these charges and this bond the same when we can clearly see, you know, there's a difference and in, in how these how these deaths, no matter what side of the law you're on, no matter what, what your opinion is about the, the, the George Floyd, I mean, George Floyd case, the, the whole makeup of how both of these deaths occurred were different, you know? So that was one thing that stuck out to me. And one thing that Mona Lisa also, she told me herself was that when she was sitting there and she saw when she finally went down to the, um, to the, the sheriff's department after they had questioned her at the house and a lot of different um, officers questioned her. And obviously, and they even in their notes were saying she wasn't paying attention, which mean that she was under the race. She was constantly asking about him. They didn't stop questioning her. But once she saw malice on her in the computer that she asked, why are y'all putting malice in here as if I meant to do this? And they told her, oh no, that's just how the computer labels it. So that made her bond go, you know, of course, a million dollars, but still that's an excessive bond for that charge. Even for second degree murder, that is an excessive bond. So once the George Floyd um, case happened, then they dropped her bond to 500,000, which is still too much. Turn around, like as of today, 
She has not spoken with her attorney. Her attorney has not come to visit, has not returned any kind of calls or anything as of March the 12th of this year. And this is a murder case. When he first met her, he told her before the emotional discovery came out, before he ever even got her side of the story, just go ahead and take the DA's plea, um, the plea that they're offering you because there's no way you can win this. So there's a lot of different things. Every time we're trying to raise money for an attorney, and now this is one thing I, you know, we can't prove, but every time we're, you know, go on sites and trying to raise money for an attorney, they get shut down. They get reported for some, like, like it's something illegal we're doing and it gets shut down. This has happened numerous times. So they are allowing the, the, the family of the deceased to speak at her bond hearings, which Miss Kathy, I thought I spoke with Miss Kathy, Miss Kathy let us know that that is not supposed to take place. And these are people that have never even met her. They have never spoken to any of uh, us to get a background on her. When we try to explain, tell them, look, can she, see? I specifically myself, my mother, uh, Marie Stokes and my uncle Joe Stokes specifically, we went to the court for her first appearance and we asked, can she be, can, can you guys do some psychological evaluations? Her attorney said, no, we, if that, if we need to do that, it's a murder case, you need to do that. No matter what is the situation is, if somebody, you just accuse anybody of murdering anyone, you should want to know what's going on in their mind. So it's just a lot of different things that are going on. And when I'm hearing everybody else's case, you know, it lets me know that it's going on across the board is, you know, I, and I, I'm just, I'm heartbroken to hear everyone. I'm just really heartbroken, you know, for my sister and for everybody else. And I think some of her brother is on the line. I think I saw his name up here. So, I mean, I'm just wanting to do what everybody else is doing and get this out, you know. I, I don't, I, I'm like the other gentleman said about his brother getting shot. It's like, what does, we don't know what to do from here. We really don't. Right. There's, there, there's no real, there's no real support. There's no accountability. Like, um, you know, every, every case I've ever, I've, people have told me about the defense attorney is always just about take the plea, ignore anything that might help their client. Uh, fight the charges. I mean, that, that's just a complete dereliction of their duty. Um, you know, the, the fact that, you know, like you, you said, the uh, Mona Lisa's attorney had, had just um, made up his mind from the very beginning and started referring to the case in, in this biased way that was a crime of passion when it was, it was not, it was self-defense. Um, yeah. And then there's, there, a, so frustrating because there doesn't seem to be recourse. Did you want to Yeah, and I, they're not taking it. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but one thing that also stands out, they're not taking into consideration. There was a nine-year-old child present. Mm -hmm. And this man says, I'm gonna shoot you. And she said in that moment, all she could think about my, my sister Mona Lisa that she didn't want to die like her mom died. Her mom died, got shot by her boyfriend. She didn't want to die the same way. And she definitely said she didn't want her daughter to see you know, have to see her laying there like that. So I don't know. You know, that's, that's a very traumatic experience. And, um, you know, and another thing about, about this case is, is the fact that if, you know, you can't, you can't afford to make bail that, that innocent people are, you know, or, you know, people who don't definitely don't deserve the charges they have are just sitting in prison for an, very long amount of time it's um you know just that, that you can buy just like you know in, with health justice which i work with a lot as well you know if you're if you have the money you can buy your health if you don't you know you're subjected to a life of sickness if you have the money to bail yourself out or get a you know a really good attorney then you know you might have your freedom and if you don't i mean it's like it's like two rules, two, two systems. And it's, um, you know, it is, it's a violation of our, of constitutional rights. And I'm so glad that, um, that you're, that you're speaking out and sharing these stories and, and seeing the similarities between them. Um, thank you, Crystal. Be before we end, I do want to go back to Matthew. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going back to Gregory and, um, who lost his brother, Matthew, he was killed by police. I wanna to talk to you a little bit, uh, I, Gregory, I was wondering if you talk a little bit about the, un, the unmet mental health needs and how um, you know, the dangers of police responding to mental health crises 
And, um, and also if you could comment a little bit on, on the obstacles that you faced in trying to get to the truth, especially at the beginning about what happened to your brother. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, in my opinion, just like in Crystal and the Mona Lisa, uh, they're, they're not concerned about anyone's mental health. And when it comes to a person's mental health, it should be checked. What person in their right mind would even attempt to kill someone or threaten someone? They're undoubtedly not thinking straight, but they didn't bother to, in Matt's situation, they didn't even bother to reach out to have family members talk to Matt while he was sitting in the car when he got shot. Uh, since then, I mean, they make out they get body cameras. And just like Rashawn's case, I think that's his name. Do you think any of the officers would be resigned or they would still be working if he didn't have that ring doorbell? They would have never lost their job. They would still be working, doing the same dirty crime that they're, they'd done then. Uh, and with the mental health issues, until they get better training, they're, they're not, it's not going to improve. Uh, law, enforcement, law enforcement doesn't really care about a person in that situation. And locking people up is all their main concern. And just like in Crystal's case, putting a half a million dollar bond on someone. And I was always taught you're innocent until proven guilty. Uh, so that term's really backwards. You're guilty until proven innocent, or she wouldn't be locked up right now with a half a million dollar bond. But in today's society, without camera footage of catching law enforcement in the wrong, you don't have a standing chance. If you'll Google it or look it up, only 1% of people's law enforcement gets convicted of crimes one percent and that one percent is like george floyd's case where the cameras was rolling if there weren't no cameras in george floyd's case what do you think would have happened they would say it was just another black man it was not obeying the law he's dead and gone and that would have been it like my brother's case there's no body cam no dash cam they went on what the law officers said they didn't even bother. And that wasn't the first time Matt had been involved with, with police officers and weren't the first time he had called them. They knew he had a mental issue when he was in that state of mind. But you think they were worried about it? And just like the family, what can we do? I mean, the DA goes on whatever the law officer says. That's the way it's always going to be. I mean, of course, we can file papers and file papers, but in a day, without people like Fairville Pack or any activist group, no one's out to hear just the average person. It's always slipped, swept under the rug. And I'm glad Rashawn had the ring bell. I wish we would have had that Matt's case where we could have seen what went on without just a police officer's testimony. But I feel sorry for anybody with mental issues and they get done the way the society does them. And until there's a change or better training to law officers with mental people with mental issues, it's going to continue. Something needs to be done about it. Rather it does. Who knows? I hope so. But we go on with our life every day without a brother. I mean, and it's unreal. And it's almost like we can't do a thing about it. I mean, it's a sad situation to be in. And I feel sorry for all the other families. It's like the guy that is this trafficking of women or whatever, or the prostitution ring or whatever. If he wouldn't have had some kind of proof and he'd be in prison right now. Because at the end of the day, I'm not a racist person. 
But if you'll look, you'll see what it mostly happens to people of color. And it's gonna continue. I mean, until there's a big change, it's gonna continue to go in that direction. In George Floyd's situation, where she mentioned the million dollar bond at first, all you gotta do is look at the two different colors of people we are. I mean, it's black and white. It's just that simple. We ain't got to read in between no lines, but it's been that way for all these years. We hope and pray it changes, but with people doing things like that, it never will. It never will. But I thank everybody for listening to my story. I feel sorry for the ones that has the sad stories because I'm in the same boat. And it's just unreal what, how we get treated in those situations. And there's no justice in a situation like that. How can you justify shooting someone or justify where in her situation where she was basically protecting her and her daughter or the nine-year-old? I mean, what was the woman supposed to do? Wait till the man killed her or the child? No, she done the right thing. But now she's locked up and been in prison and offering they just want to throw her to the side and not even try to give her any justice. So until things change, it's gonna to continue to happen to us. And if the only thing would have helped her out in that situation, if somebody would have been videotaping it. If somebody would have had a camera phone out where she would have had a, some kind of evidence to prove it, then she'd been in a different situation. But that's why I advise anybody to pull a camera out if they see any injustice going on, whether it was law officers, family members, anything. But I'm saddened to hear all the other stories I've heard tonight. And pray for all of you. I hope y'all continue to pray for my family. Because we've been through something. My brother's only happened nine months ago, eight months ago. I'm going to tell you why. Mm. It was a life changing experience. And it'll, it'll leave your heart hard towards law enforcement. And you hate to feel that way about anybody, but. The way law officers does people, it, it'll make you real mad and upset about it. I'm not gonna lie to you. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna lie to you. And a day goes by where bad thoughts don't go through my head. Mm -hmm. And but I want y'all just just remember me and my family. I remember y'all's family as well. And hopefully. Some kind of justice come out of it. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Miss Kathy's helped me through this a lot, especially when I get her text. Uh, I've been quiet for the last few months. Haven't really said much of nothing, especially after the DA said that uh, nothing's going to be done to the officers. That hits hard. So. Sorry for the tears, but it's just a hard situation to be in. Mm -hmm. A real hard situation. I thank y'all for listening to my brother's story, but hopefully things will change. I sure hope so anyway. But I, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Gregory. I I I keep you and, and Matthew in my thoughts just like um, a lot of the stories that I've heard, I, I remember the details and I, I keep the people in my thoughts and and I don't know if there are adequate words to really express the sorrow over these injustices, but I do, I do, I, do, I think many people, everyone on this call feels the anger as well at the rage at the injustice, the, um, the senseless life, life lost and the time lost as well for people who were incarcerated. Um, 
in addition to, to hearing your, your story at Matthew's uh, violent death, I've also talked to several uh, mothers who lost their children, who, whose children were killed by police, and, and a woman whose husband was killed by police. And this is all in, this, in the same um, area of North Carolina. Um, there's just rampant um, injustice. And I do take heart and take hope in, in the work that Fayetteville PAC does. And then all of the people who are coming forward to, to tell the stories, to make the connections and, and um, make sure that their loved ones, that, that their stories are known and that are heard. I thank you all so much for being here tonight, for sharing your stories um, and being part of this. Be before we ended, I wanted to see if any of the Fayetteville PAC board members wanted to have any, um, make any comments. Monique or James or um, Chileco, would you, or Kathy, would you like to say something? Um, it, I thought Chileco was saying something, but um, no, nobody has a thing to say. Oh, okay. okay. I'll let Chileco say something. Good evening, everyone. My name is Chileco Hurst. Vice one vice presidents for Fable Pack. I heard everyone's stories. And it's really not a story. It's really a testimony of their running and suffering injustice over overzealous law enforcement in the state of North Carolina. That's what it is. Overzealous policing in the state of North Carolina. Mr. Oxendine. My heart bleeds for you. Brothers and sisters that have been falsely imprisoned and incarcerated, I've been there. Know the situation. Just know that the fight will continue. We will not, <clears throat> we will not stop. We will not give up. Just document, document, document. And it will be addressed at one time or another. Fever pack is for the people all the time, anytime. That's my message. Thank you. Thank you, Chilico, and all the families on this panel. I, I just want to say thank you for taking time tonight to tell your stories. We will continue to amplify your stories. We will continue to address them with the DOJ and, and all other entities that is held accountable, as you all know. Um, when we started Fayetteville Pack, we said we will always be for the families. Me and Sean, the founder, he's not on tonight, but um, this is something that we're always going to keep doing. It's all about the families for us. It's not about a. It's not about a picture. It's not about a photo out. It's about getting the justice for the families, and we will continue to help you and serve you as much as we can in that entity because um, we are public servants and we believe that everyone deserves the right to be free and everyone de deserves the right to be treated as a human being. And we must hold those accountable that knows that their policies that they're supposed to follow and don't. And I just wanna say thank you for coming on here and we're gonna continue to fight for you. And I will continue to always reach out. And if anybody needs anything, you know how to reach me and let's, let's, let's go ahead and put everyone out there. You know, we're putting them out there on the Zoom. We're putting them out there through the DOJ, but we got to still keep putting them out there. We got to do some DA removals. We got to expose what it is. Um, but we 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 don't um, rush things. We always go with the family pace. And we know that, you know, the family has to grieve when we know that the healing process, but we're going to always fight no matter what. But thank you. Um, so this is Monique Edwards. I'm a board member for Federal PAC. And, um, and I'd like to just echo the same sentiments as Chalico, as well as Kathy Gregg. And also just add that I, I am really proud to be a board member with this organization because they, we are about the accountability. And you know the one thing that attracted me to the organization was that they were focused on getting justice for the families. And I do agree, we will keep doing that because all of these things are just, so horrific that we really just we have you know really reached a point where we have to hold people more accountable and that we just cannot 
continue to grow numb to all of the injustices that are going on in North Carolina. And we got to get past, you know, the public facing persona that some of um, these DAs and and other prosecutors and even, you know, the lack of defense with the defense attorneys and these matters with the judges and law enforcement, we just cannot continue to allow this public face and persona as though, you know, they're really helping the people in the community when the reality is, is that when these people get in front of them and they have their life and their liberty in their hands, they are literally throwing people away. And that's the one thing that we definitely cannot continue to have happen. Everyone in this state matters. And I'm really glad that Fayetteville PAC has taken on this charge. And thank you so much to the families and to everyone who has come on to speak about, you know, what has happened to either themselves or their family members. Thank you, Monique. Is there anyone else who'd like to say any final word? Yes, I would like to say something. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the PAC and the organization just for just being. Uh, Marcus, you got uh, muted. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh oh. We can hear you now. I think he's pressing his mute. I think he's pressing the mute. Now we can hear you, Marcus, but you keep pressing your mute. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing wrong. Okay, there you go. I just want to just thank everybody, my mom, my family, my cousin, everyone who, who took the time to listen to me, to be there, accept the phone calls everything and I'm gonna keep fighting and everyone's story that I heard tonight man it really touched me and all we just gotta keep doing it. we just can't stop here and if we ain't gonna do it, it it'll stop so we gotta keep pushing no matter how long it takes something's gonna get done because I always believe that if it's right it's right and we're all right here and I just I just want to thank everybody definitely thank you for y'all stories though and we just keep pushing forward with everything too. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. And thank you, Stacy, for moderating this. Thank you. And being um, a Facebook Pack volunteer and all the thank stories. You. Thank you. I'm honored to be part of this. And um honored to just grateful to be to be learning how to be um a better advocate by by knowing really the the truth and the details of of what goes on and what gets covered up and um, just determined to use my voice and my my writing to to help expose this and just glad to be in community with you all. So um, please remember to, to follow the Fayetteville Pact face, Facebook page if you aren't already, the, the links in the chat and you'll find all of the stories that we talked about here tonight. Um, there on that page. They're, they're also linked to in the chat higher up. But um, again, thank you everyone for participating. And um, we'll, we'll close it out for tonight. We'll keep um, each other in our thoughts as we as we work towards justice. Thank you for being here. And uh, Kathy says, please, please tune in tomorrow night. Um, Dawn Blagrove from Emancipate NC is going to be talking about why do we plea? Uh, because we're not, because some people are not given another option, which is a great injustice, and we've got a great attorney working on that. So I hope you can tune into the the same uh, Fayetteville Pact Facebook page at seven p.m. tomorrow. Right. Uh, Andrew, did you want to say something? Yeah, I want to say thank you, Stacy and Kathy, and y'all doing good work, not only for color but for all injustice. You know, if these people wouldn't know what was happening, we won't for y'all, you know. But the things happening way beyond what they ain't seen. What's inside, even inside that jail, it's, it's like it's an organization and they're using to make money, rent, you know, 
you're not getting locked up just because, you know, officers want to do a case. They got to meet quotas. These officers meet quotas and get recognition and promotions from these. So that's what they use it for. You know, they, they're bringing us together like that and, and incarcerate us. I was in there when they had COVID. They refused to give us masks until we filed grievances. Officers were walking around in Cumberland County Jail with masks on for months, and we didn't get no masks. As soon as I come out, I got COVID, and I had to go to the hospital, and they they diagnosed me with COVID as soon as I got out. And I still haven't got ID or nothing. Can't get no work because of the internet. It'll put me on the internet and on and on the news, and I I can't get no kind of work. I can't do nothing. I'm sitting here just like this, and I've been sitting here since I got out. No problem to sit. No financial aid or nothing. You know, I done tried everything. It, and don't have no help in filing my paperwork. I'm doing the whole lawsuit myself. I don't have no help. I got stacks and stacks of paper that I sit down and I got to hand write. I got to go and research law. I got to put all this together in small terms. You know, they got their paralegals and everything. They just throw that together and get their best lawyers, which they pay for, you know, and they transferred all the officers. They sent all the officers. But what get me was, in coming to county jail, when I filed a motion, they told me that I could not file a motion. I mean, they would not notarize the, uh, my motion. I've they've been notarizing my motion for a whole 16 months. All of a sudden, when I wrote to Police Chief Gina Hawkins and told her the, when they looked on the video to show that the officer planned the evidence filed a complaint. They told me they can't notarize it. And I asked them why they know, I, y'all can't notarize it. They say because I got a lawsuit against the state. What the lawsuit got to be, what the lawsuit got to be done, you know, about her notarizing me. But thank y'all, you know. Thank I you, Andy. I need to go against the media because my story is here on Facebook, mm-hmm. they got me mm-hmm. on there as a sex offender. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not, I'm not a sex offender. I've been, you know, found guilty of it, but it still stayed mm-hmm. with the answer faulty rope. This mm-hmm. stuff he that got on the media, nobody even said. Mm-hmm. Also wrote his own warm stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, well, I couldn't figure out and put it on news. And when I asked him, I asked him, I said, I asked the detective Hagenberg, I said, how long have you been a detective? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I you never came to me and asked me any questions. Mm-hmm. I was talking mm-hmm. paperwork and it was show. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But they, they, they didn't even go get my uh, job. I had a registered lawyer and then he sent this in the paperwork on my job showing that I ain't, I ain't never been a mm-hmm. and I and I work, you know, I drive a forklift. Mm-hmm. So when they see that they lower my bar. They go in there and lower my bar from four hundred thousand to twenty five thousand. Mm-hmm. I still don't have twenty five thousand to get out. You know? mm-hmm. You see that I won't hear the warrants they February the first and I did not even move here to March the eighteenth. Mm-hmm. If you see that how can I be human trafficking people holding them in the house and I'm not here? <laughs> and I got paperwork and video camera and video camera, everything at my job showing that I'm driving this horse mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then when I tell the lawyer to go get the videos from the stores, the corner stores that show that these people are lying, they don't go get the videos. They come back later, six months later, come out. But we can't retrieve the videos now. It was a whole setup, mm-hmm. and it was going through the courts. The judge, judge even told me like this. The judge told me, he said, "You see all these guys in the courtroom." He said, "They would love to take the plea that I'm trying to give you." Mm-hmm. 
He said, he said, if I convict you, I'm going to give you life. Mm-hmm. And he said, you'll never be able to see your grandkids again. And at your age, you'll die mm-hmm. before you even get out. Mm-hmm. And I said, why is he saying all this to me? Because I reject the plea. Mm-hmm. You know? Hey, that's that's that, that's that me with incarceration that I didn't want to plead. Right. This thing is a whole money thing built up, you know, and it's and it's not against just the blacks, it is against the poor and the minority. Mm-hmm. You know, it's mm-hmm. just anybody that's poor and a minority that cannot defend themselves. Mm-hmm. They make sure. A lawyer don't bring you not one piece of paper. Can nobody in that jail show a piece of paper that a lawyer gave them showing anything? Mm-hmm. The lawyers do not come and see it. They make sure they don't have no paper trail. And mm-hmm. they make sure you don't ask for enough evidence. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Because what's, what's ain't right at right there, you, it's hard to appeal within the Supreme Court. Right. You, you must have evidence so anything that's in there can be you can appeal and keep appealing to, to fight your case. But if you don't right. have that, you just have their word against yours. Right, exactly. I think your your case, what you're saying speaks a lot to how, you know, people's lives are ruined over, over these false charges. It's not just the ordeal of being, you know, incarcerated and then maybe pleading or getting them dismissed and getting out. I mean, it really has an impact on, on your life after that, on your relationships, on your job prospects, okay. and how you're viewed viewed by the community, and it's you know it's completely unfair. Um, so um, we thank you all. I, I think Andrew, we're gonna we're gonna clo- we're gonna close it tonight just because we've been on the call for for a while. But I think we're gonna continue. You know, we're gonna continue these conversations and and sharing these stories. And then uh, we do have more panels. Fayetteville Pact has more panels um, at 7 p.m. The, the rest of the week. So please do check those out. And again, thank you all so much for being here. I have a blessed day. I always yeah. tell everybody I have a blessed day. All have right. a great night. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Oh, 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 oh.